Ephesians chapter 3, if you would, if you turn there. You need a Bible. You need a Bible. All righty. Um, what I'm going to uh, start tonight, I've, I've done this before, uh, as with a lot of things I do. I've done it all before. Um, Ephesians chapter 3 is where uh, God taught me about a higher dimension than the one you and I experience every day. Uh, and I'll explain it like this. A one-dimensional object only, only knows that it, it, it exists. But it doesn't have any comprehension of motion to the left or to the right or to the front or to the back. Certainly it doesn't understand going up or going down. Um, and I am not really aware of a, of a one-dimensional object, but the universe has to be built on something. And so there is a, a one-dimensional object I guess in our minds, I don't know. A two-dimensional object uh, ha has the ability of motion because an object in two dimensions can move right to left, forward and back, and anything in that radius of degrees, it can move in those directions, but it does not have any knowledge, nor can it conceive of the ideas of up or down. We are three-dimensional objects living in a three-dimensional universe because we can either stand still like a one-dimensional object or we can move forward and backward and we can move left to right. We can move in a circle of 360 degrees of any, any way we want to. Also, you can take that circle and turn it up like this, and we have the ability to understand everything in a 360 degree radius that travels down and then up and then down again. All, and I am, I am six foot three inches tall. Um, I am this wide and this wide. And so I am a three dimensional object. Everybody here is, and everything, everything that we can see and everything that we know, except our shadows, they're all three-dimensional objects. Um, if you want to see that, see that how it was made, turn to Genesis 1. Because you have it right here. And, you'll, and, and they're all connected. Time, space, and matter or material things are all linked together. That's what um, Einstein's theory of relativity had to do with. It is one that one of these is relative to the other. Time and space are the same. You cannot have three-dimensional space without time. It can't exist. There has to be linear time in the world that we live in and literally every thought that we have, every single thought that we have in our mind is based upon the fact that time and the space that we live in and the matter of which we are consist of or let's say you think of something else. Let's say you're thinking right now of a, of a gag to shove down my mouth so I quit talking. Okay, that is that gag will move in three-dimensional space. It is made, it is a material thing made of three-dimensional matter and it will fit into this big three-dimensional hollow space right here and it will take you time to do it because I'll fight you tooth and nail. So notice the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, that's time. That's God creating time because you cannot have anything else in the universe that you're going to have, which is matter and space, until you create time, until you start the clock. 
In the beginning, God created the heaven, that's space, three-dimensional space, and the earth, that is three-dimensional material or matter. All right? And when I say matter, I'm talking about everything that has substance, everything that can be felt, everything that is detected, everything like that, with the exception of shadows, everything that is seen, everything that is heard is three-dimensional. It has this way, this way, and this way. All right? So, when I was, um, when I was studying numbers in the Bible, I had already written uh, the book by divine order, and um, Noah Hutchings had written a book called God the Master Mathematician. And he was wanting to upgrade that book and update it. And so he asked me, um, he knew I was a numbers guy, so he asked me if I would uh, just sort of uh, take what I learned and take what he had and sort of rewrite a bunch of stuff. And he would write some things and they would, they would fit it in to chapters. Somebody would edit both pieces and put them into chapters. And there would be a new book uh, by Noah Hutchings and myself on Bible numbers. Um, when I got done with what I had, I sent it to him. And he either liked it a lot or he didn't like any of it because he didn't put it in his book. So I like to think that he liked it so well because he did say, he said, I realized after reading this that it's its own book. So maybe that was a nice way of saying, I'm not touching this with a 10-foot pole. But I, I, loved, I loved Noah Hutchings. I got a great respect for him. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. And uh, my respect for him jumped when um, I, had, I had been to his church. Um, he went to church there in, uh, in around Bethany, Oklahoma, where their offices were. And um, it was a Baptist church. And their pastor had resigned. He had been pastor there for years. Uh, a lot of the people at Southwest Radio went to that church. And when the pastor resigned and retired, they got a younger pastor in. And this is where it always starts. Boom. He's going to make all the changes. We're going to get rid of the pews. We're going to get rid of the, uh, the choir. We're going to throw out the hymn books. We're going to have a hymn book burning. And uh, we're going to darken the sanctuary. And we're going to have a praise team up there. And I went to Rick Warren's... Uh, uh, Purpose Driven Church School. So I know how to do all these things. And we're going to build us a mega church. And Noah had done his study on Rick Warren and his purpose-driven life and his purpose-driven church movement and found it to be greatly wanting in Scripture. And he confronted that pastor. And I know Noah. Noah was an older man, but when I first met him, he was 77. He died, I think he was like 95, something like that. So I'd known him for quite a while. But um, he was a very gentle man, but very, he knew the Bible. And he went to this pastor addressing his concerns with following after Rick Warren. And the pastor said, well, he said, I appreciate that. I really do. And he said, it just sort of tells me that maybe this church isn't for you. And he run him off. He run him off. He run probably the, one of the wisest men that church had. And I guarantee a bunch of people left with him. And um, so Noah Hutchings... Um, whenever, whenever he felt moved to do it, he would deal with some issue on their broadcast. Uh, they were on a, over a hundred and probably 150 radio stations at the time across the country in Canada. And whenever he spoke out against Rick Warren, there was about a third of the radio stations that would not air that program or those programs because money. Money, money. And what he told me was, he said, Mike, he said, when this ministry started, I can't remember the, uh, can't remember the name, it's a man by the name of Weber that began Southwest Radio. And he said, when, when he began this program, he said, you had mom and pop owned stations. You had family owned radio stations all over the country, usually AM stations. And he said, you could preach whatever you wanted to preach. And he said, God's people would lap it up. But he said, what I've seen in the last 10, 15 years is that these smaller stations are being bought out by these big corporations. Um, bought Radio Network. Um, who owned KJSL? There was a station here in town, KJSL, um, on AM 630. Or, yeah, KJSL. And they were owned by a big company, and so on and so on. And these big companies basically shut down 
ministries like Southwest Radio, they wouldn't let them on their air. They had made contracts with these professionals and because they knew they weren't going to say anything controversial, that would keep the money, the ad revenue rolling in. And that's what it was all about. It became about money. But anyway, I, was, I said all that to say this. <laughs> it's, time to, it's time to go home now. Um, when I was doing this, the research for this new book, I had it in my mind that, okay, we live in a three-dimensional world. And, and in the back of my mind, I knew that Paul had, had a verse where it talked about, you know, depth, width, and so on. And I thought, well, there's, he mentions three dimensions there. So I knew that, you know, Genesis 1-1 talked about it. And there were some other places. So I went to Genesis, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 3. And when I found the verse, it didn't have three dimensions. It had four. And that threw me. I'm like, four? I'd never heard of there being four dimensions. I'd never heard that. And so I, uh, I went to Google. This has been several years ago, but I started researching it. Sure enough, lo and behold, there's a fourth dimension. And everything that I read about what the fourth dimension is, and how to visualize it, how to conceive of it, what it would look like and so on and how it how a person would act and react in a fourth dimensional um, spatial dimension uh, was right here in the Bible. And I'm like, I can't believe this. This Bible is totally God's handbook of creation. It is the architect's notes of how everything in his creation was to be. The rules that are part of physics, how that everything in the physical realm, when you study physics, you're studying the physical realm, how everything in physics has rules and those rules just are not broken. The, the law of gravity is a law and you can't break the law of gravity. Boom, you'll die. And so, when I started looking at the four dimensions, I was totally amazed at what our Bible... Now, it is important to know this, I think, because I think it's important to know then what the Bible says and what it is referring to when it talks about a fourth kingdom. That I used to believe that it was like what everybody else said, it's to revive Roman Empire, and that's what you're going to believe, and you don't believe anything else except we tell... And I'm like... Okay, it's the revived Roman Empire. But now I look at it and I'm going, number one, I never found that in the Bible anywhere. I never read it. The Bible doesn't say a word about it being the revived Roman Empire. I don't know who came up with that. I don't know where they were getting it from. They didn't get it from the Bible. And it gave me an understanding of what that kingdom actually was and what it was made of and why it's represented by the iron and why it's the clay and the iron cannot be mingled together. Okay. So anyway, that's, that's the direction that we're going in tonight. And uh, it's going to take us a little while to get through it, but we're going to have fun with it, all right? So let's go to Ephesians chapter 3. Um, let's look at verse 9 and we'll read down. Uh, Paul said, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. In other words, our, our responsibility as the church is to... Give understanding to people of the nature and character of God, the nature and character of Jesus Christ, who he is, and give them an understanding of how God is going to take lost sinners who themselves are reprobate and turn them into the saints of God that will live forever. That's the fellowship of the mystery and it's our responsibility to teach the world these truths which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So who is the creator? It's Jesus Christ. He is the word of God that was spoken and the word did not return to God void. It did exactly what he sent it forth to do. And thus we have the universe that we live in right now. Verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers, and we've been studying that on Sunday morning, so we know that they are devils. In heavenly places, there's another clue that they are devils. 
in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. In other words, these principalities and powers, if they want to learn anything about God's mystery, they're going to have to get it from us. Imagine that. That God made us lower than the angels, but apparently we're smarter than they are. Because we know what the mystery is. Now, verse... Um, uh, 14, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul suffered immensely for the gospel's sake. Uh, there is a movie and I don't know who made it, but I thought it was well done. It, it speaks of the last, I don't know, the last few months of the Apostle Paul's life. It's called the Apostle Paul, I think. And um, I watched it and I'm like, man, what he went through. Prison, being beaten, uh, being nearly killed. They hated Paul. And I'll tell you, it's very similar to the hatred that exists now. Right now, however, at least in this country, we're not killed for the fact that we believe in Jesus Christ. But that could all turn. It's verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And I, I just want to stop and address this for a minute as you underline the phrase inner man. Because, you know, I grew up in church. I've, I've been around Christianity pretty much all my life. I've heard one sermon after another. Constantly, constantly... Um, Oh, no, no, laying guilt on church people of them. Every now and then I get sad. Every now and then I get depressed. Every now and then I feel the weight of the responsibility on me. Every now and then things go wrong and I'm left wondering what in the world's going on here. And so I will be the first to admit that I'm not all smiles and I'm on the winning football team all the time. I'm not that person every day. Some days, you're not going to see me smile. Some days, you can't make me smile. And you've got all these people saying, well, if you was at a ball game, you'd be rejoicing over that ball game. How come you can't? I'm going, well, because I don't go to a ball game on Sunday. I go to a church on Sunday. This is not a baseball game. It's not, not about beating the, the lost people. Okay. And so, I believe that while the outer person of you may be feeling the effects of living in this world, there is an inner man, a new man inside of you that can rejoice, though the world may not be able to see it. And that's what he's saying here. If you look at what he said, that you be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. While your outer man is weak, has no joy, it has no hope. Um, things make you angry, things get you upset, things hurt your feelings. But in my inner man, I know I'm going to heaven. And I, re I may rejoice in my inner man and you may not ever see it. Okay? Um, I, you know, I've, I've been around people who, you know, when they get a joy in them, they, they reflect it in their outer, in their outer man. In the church service. I don't have a problem with that. As long as it's not some kind of wildfire or some kind of show that people are putting on. Uh, but just because I don't act the way they act or react the way they react does not mean that I'm any less saved or any less filled with the Spirit than they are. It's just that I just don't normally react that way in my emotions. Especially when it comes to what I believe is the truth. However, my inner man does. My inner man's wanting to fly every day. My new man on the inside is 
shouting with joy and ready to take on hell by itself. That's the inner man that's in me. That's the one that was conceived of God. And it cannot sin because it was born of God. So now in verse 17, here we go. Verse 17 and 18. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Notice he didn't say in your head, in your body, in your arms, your feet. Christ dwells in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love, comma, he's not done, may be able to comprehend. What does comprehend mean? To understand. With all saints, what is the breadth? That's the first one. And length, the second one. And depth. Now we have three dimensions. We have breadth, length, and depth. There is a fourth one, and he called it height. So as I'm looking at this for the very first time with this understanding, I'm going, okay, so how would I find this fourth dimension in the Bible? And I'm asking God that. God, how would I, how would I find this in the Bible? And God's like, we'll read the verse again, Hoggard. So I... Uh, read the verse again and it said height and I went is it that simple lo and behold it is so and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with well, all the fullness of God down unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us and to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end amen <gasps> and that sentence starts in verse 14, okay? So from verse 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, that's all one sentence. If you think I'm long-winded, Paul is. There's a lot of verbs and nouns to, to, uh, to outline, right? Anyway, back to, the, back to the four dimensions. Breadth is width, length, depth, and then he mentions height. So we go back to Job 22. Notice, the, notice what's being spoken of here. Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold the height of the stars, how high they are. So, I've mentioned this before. The Bible's telling us that every star that we can see and the ones we can't see, with, like with Hubble and the, the Webb telescope, which is producing phenomenal pictures of galaxies and stars and everything like we didn't even know existed. And all they do is aim it at a dark space in, in the sky that we cannot see anything there and let it go for a few days and then look at the picture and all of a sudden there's more things there than we can count. But they are very, very, very far away. So the Bible teaches us over and over and over and over again that every star is an angel. Now science cannot handle that. Science cannot accept that because they don't accept the scriptures as any proof. But that's where faith comes in. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So while I may not be able to see the rest of the angel that that star represents, when I see that star, I believe that the rest of the angel is there in whatever form God created it to be in. And the fact that I can only see this one little dot doesn't tell me that what God said was wrong, it tells me, simply tells me that because I live in a three-dimensional world, I can only fathom and understand that point of light that I'm able to see. Okay? Um, how can I illustrate this? I need some place where you can see my shadow. Huh? Here? Okay. Okay. 
Do what? Now, here's my shadow. Okay? Now, my shadow is two-dimensional. And remember, in two-dimensional world, a guy actually wrote a book about this about 100 years ago. And this is called Flatland. Okay, because it's only two-dimensional. So he said, he was, you know, basically making up a, a story that there was this world called Flatland, and it was two-dimensional, and that all the people that lived in Flatland were only two-dimensional beings, okay? So now, what would happen in a two-dimensional world? Here, I'll do, I'll do this, okay? Can you see my shadow on my Bible? Okay? So if I, as a three-dimensional being put myself into this two-dimensional world. Everybody who lives in Flatland, what, what is it of me that they can see? Only the part where my finger is touching in their world. And yet, there is way more to that of me than just this two-dimensional point of contact as I place my finger into flatland. Does that make sense, everybody? So you go up, you take that same principle and you go up one level. So now this is 3D land. A fourth dimensional creature like an angel or a star or anything up there making its contact and its presence seen in this three-dimensional world, we're only going to see three dimensions of it. Because we can't fathom what a fourth dimension even is, much less where it is. We have no idea. Just like the people in Flatland, they have no knowledge of things being up and down. So 3D man is injected here into this two-dimensional world. He's a god to these people, isn't he? Because he can move. He can actually do this. He can actually leave Flatland and fly over to another part of Flatland and land. And they went, he disappeared, and now he's over here. Ring any bells? Ring any Bible bells? Absolutely. Jesus walked through a whole crowd without, him, without them touching him. And they were like, where did he go? And he's like walking through this throng of people and not touching any of them. We have Philip, who is, when he comes out of the water, he's immediately caught up. And he ends up over here in the three-dimensional world. And it's like he didn't touch any of the ground between uh, where, the, where the pool was and where he ended up. He didn't touch any of the space here. So they're like, where did he go? He didn't disappear. He just is up in the fourth dimension and now he's here. Okay? Some people go, why do we got to know this? It's like algebra. Why do we have to know this? Right? Trust me. You need it. So is not God in the height of heaven? Behold the height of the stars, how high they are. So what you're seeing up there is only what you can see. Unless, I don't know how they do it, but they can make an appearance in this world. Okay? So, we're not done. Psalm 102, 19. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. And by the way, just as in two, just as in Flatland, let's say the people who live on verse 7 Street over here, let's say that they want to look around and see what's out there, but they can't see anything past Mr. W here. Because Mr. W is blocking what comes after Mr. W. It's like us trying to look down a street from where the houses are. We can only see one house at a time. We have to Move the houses out of the way. So Mr. Seven here can only see Mr. W, but he can't see all the other letters in this line here. He can't see them because Mr. W is blocking the way. However, Mr. 3D man, what can he see of the 2D flatland world? Sure he can. He can see all of it, can he? Because he's higher are you catching the words I'm using? He's higher than they are. 
What did God say in the Psalms about how he made man versus the angels? Say it again, Chris. He's made us a little lower than the angels. So while we can only see what's right in front of us, they can see a whole lot more than we can. And I'll, I'll, let me give you this illustration. Uh, Chris, you were in the military, so you kind of understand this, okay? If they're going to put you on guard duty, let's say you got guard duty tonight, okay? And they say, now, Chris, for guard duty tonight, what we need you to do is dig a great big pit, make it about eight feet tall, get down in it, and you'll be on guard duty tonight, and I don't want you to let anything go past you. What's the problem with that? Can't see nothing. Okay? So you're going, uh, Colonel, forgive me. With all due respect, sir, I think I'd be much better able to see up on top of a tower. Don't you think, sir? Uh, you know, the military. Right? <laughs> He's going to say, no, I want you down in the pit. Okay, sir, it's your, your ball game. But realistically, you can see better and you can see farther. Higher up you go. Are you catching this? So, who is the most high? And what can God see? Everything. Why? Because he's higher than all other things. The serpent, however, when God cursed the serpent, took the legs off of him. And the, certain, the serpent is actually lower than the ant is. At least the ant crawls about this high up off the ground, while the serpent is right on the ground. And what can the serpent see from his vantage point? Not much. Not much. So what does Lucifer want to do? I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like, he didn't say God. He didn't say Jesus. He said, I will be like the most high. What does he want for being up there? He wants to be able to have the all seeing ability that God has. But he's not going to get it, is he? Okay. Neither, neither is man. Man wants it. I mean, it's, it's, a. Uh, we're in the space age now. So we've graduated as a military power. We've graduated from building high towers to flying high aircraft to putting spy satellites above the earth because the spy satellite with a good enough camera can take a picture of the entire face of the earth and see the whole hemisphere of planet earth all at once. The higher we get, the more we're able to see and the better vantage point. Russia knew this. We knew it. That when we started, when Russia sent up the first rocket, the Sputnik, it scared most of America, including our military. Because the military is like, okay, what, what's to stop them from sending up a satellite with a camera on it that will spy on all of our facilities? What's to stop them? Nothing. There's nothing that can stop them. So they realize we had to keep up with Russia, if not surpass them, because whoever sees that from the highest point is going to have the advantage in case any war breaks out. The idea is the higher that you stand, the more you're able to see. Satan doesn't have much of ability to see. He's down low, but he wants that ability to see all things like God does. So he says, I will be like the most high. He's, he's telling you his heart. Uh, Psalm 148, one, praise ye the Lord. Oh, notice in Psalm 102, 19, he, for he has looked down from the height of his sanctuary from heaven, did the Lord behold the earth. So the Bible is equating the word height with heaven. Psalm 148, one, praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights. See how it's making that analogy there. Uh, Proverbs 25, three, the heaven for height, the earth for depth. And the heart of kings is unsearchable. So basically, the Bible's telling you that in this area, this fourth dimension referred to as height or heaven, we can't search it out. 
We can't understand it. We can't fathom it. We don't know if I were to ask you to point to me the fourth spatial dimension, what direction is it in? We have no way. If we pointed up on the other side of the earth, someone's pointing up, but they're pointing in a different direction, aren't they? You see, it, no matter where you are on the, on the round earth, the globe, the, you know, ball earth, you got to say that now, where you are on this planet, no matter what direction you point up, it's a different direction than somebody else. Okay? That's because we can't fathom this fourth dimension. Matthew 4, 8. Now listen to this. Notice the devil took, taketh him up into a high mountain, but the mountain exceeds high. Does that make sense to you? It goes beyond being a high mountain. It's an exceeding high mountain. The trumpets that they heard at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19 were exceeding loud. That means they were way beyond what normal loud is. They were so loud they were intolerable. What happened? Some devil took over my laptop. Um, they were exceeding what loud was. That's why the Israelites were going, make that stop. We can't handle it. Moses going up to Mount Sinai. How many days was he up there? Forty days. And while he's up there, did he need to eat? He didn't need a bite. Did he need to drink? He didn't drink nothing. For 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't drink nothing. Didn't eat anything. Why? He's in a different place, I believe. Okay? Luke 4, 5. The, and notice this, the devil taking... Um, oh, let, let, me, let me back up to Matthew 4, 8. He take him up to an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now, I think, and you, you could disagree, I think that was all the kingdoms from Babel all the way to the end of the world. Because certainly he's in the place to do it. He's in an exceeding high place, which gives him the ability. And the flat, let me tell you what the flat earth people say about this verse. They say, that proves the earth is flat right there. Because how did the devil take Jesus up into a place where he could see all the kingdoms of the world? If the earth is a ball, you can't see around a ball, can you? So the earth must have been flat. Oh, those people wore me out. If you are a dimension above a 3D ball, you can see the whole thing. I don't understand it, but you can do it. Uh, and so then in Luke 4, 5, the devil taking him up to a high mountain showed him unto him all the kingdoms of the earth of the world in a moment of time. Boom. So now not only is he in a higher spatial dimension where he can see a round ball and see all sides of it all at once, he can also do it instantly because the fourth dimension represents time and anything in that dimension is not bound by linear time. It's not bound by that. Um, have you ever read a story or seen a movie or anything like that where somebody is going to travel back in time to change something in the past to make something work out in the present or the future? Have you ever seen that movie? Is it possible that the devil thinks that it's possible to go back in time and alter an event that took place in history. Let me give you two illustrations. You remember when Hezekiah um, was dying and he wanted to know from Isaiah whether or not he was going to live. And Isaiah said, of course you're going to live. And Hezekiah said, well, I need proof. Isaiah said, okay, Hezekiah, do you want, see that sundial there? Do you want the shadow to go back or do you want it to go forward? 10 degrees. 10 degrees 
on a sundial, guess how many minutes that is? Take a wild guess. 40. It's 40 minutes. And so Hezekiah said, uh, wait a minute, the sundial is going to move forward anyway. That's nothing. Make it go back 10 degrees. So it went back 10 degrees. So you know what I think happened? I think they went back 40 minutes. Okay? Instead of God moving the entire universe, I think they went back 40 minutes. Okay? Which only God can do. The beast, when we look at the book of Daniel, and we, and we try to discern things about the beast in the book of Daniel, one of the things that we read in there is that the beast will seek to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand. Meaning he will have the ability to alter times. If you were the devil and you had the ability to go back in one trip and try to alter the future, what place would you go to? Golgotha. Because you realized after Christ rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, whoops, that was the wrong move. Because now he's done in. It's over with. The battle's been won. The victory is gained. God's people are his people. And so if you're the devil, you go back to Calvary. You go back to Golgotha and you change that. So that Jesus doesn't get killed. But it's one of those things. I, here's how I got it. One of those things that no matter how many billions of times he can go back and try to change the past. It still ends up with Jesus on that cross. God's not going to stray from that. Amen. Amen. So he can see all the kings of the world in a moment of time. And I'll give you this and we'll, we'll close for tonight. Genesis 1.14. Turn there. Notice the language. Notice the numbers. This is, this is, I'm giving you the steps that I took to learn this. This is, this is how my mind brought me from one thing to the next. So in Genesis 1.14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Four things. That these lights are there for. And I do think that light has something to do with. Um, how can I say it? I think light has everything to do with the difference between dimensions. Uh, it's just like, just like me making a two-dimensional shadow. That's only possible by way of a three-dimensional light, okay? The light shining through space to reflect on my hand, and my hand is actually stopping the light from reaching this area here on this two-dimensional surface, okay? So I think light definitely has something to do with it. Um, I won't get into all the different ideas about light and so on. Uh, but let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. And what we know and understand is that these stars are, they, they are angels. They are the angelic beings. Uh, let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning, here it is, the fourth day. God did this on purpose. He specifically did this creating on the fourth day. So when people ask me, Pastor, what, what day do you think the angels were made? I think they were created on day four. To me, that matches everything else that the Bible says about angels and what they are. Star, 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 star here, star there. The star of your God, Remphan. Um, the bright and morning star. Jesus is the star of Jacob. And so on. And so these stars, I believe, represent and are 
what little glimpses of the angelic realm that we can see. And they, of course, were created on the fourth day of creation. Uh, so we have an Old Testament earthly Jerusalem. We have a New Testament heavenly Jerusalem. And that Jerusalem is the city that lieth how? Four square. Why? Because it's higher than the other Jerusalem. Okay? It's one up from there. Whereas, right now, if... Let's say that a war started between nations over Jerusalem. Who's going to possess Jerusalem? Right now, you have a very volatile mix of so-called Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, and all of them are claiming that this town is their holy city. Guarantee you, the Vatican would kill everybody they needed to kill to gain access to be the exclusive owners of the Temple Mount and Jerusalem itself. So would the Jews. So would the Muslims. They're all ready to go to war at the drop of a hat for possession of Jerusalem. Because to them, that city is their holy city. And without that city, their religion couldn't exist. And in and, and talking about that, uh, back when, um, you know, right after we dealt with 9-11, and our government was figuring out the response to that, you know, what, what Middle East nation we should start bombing first, there was a guy on, on the radio, and I agree 100% with what he said. He said, if you want to put a stop to this, bomb Mecca. Don't, don't bomb Iran, don't bomb Iraq, don't bomb Saudi Arabia, bomb Mecca. Blow Mecca completely up. Because once you do that, the Muslims have no religion. Because a, a major part of their belief system is you cannot go to paradise without a pilgrimage to Mecca. You cannot live for Allah without stopping five times a day, every day, rolling out a carpet, bowing down and facing Mecca. If Mecca and that Kaaba, that big block, that box there that they swirl around like toilet water in a toilet, that city, if you destroyed that, your Muslim menace is done. Because they don't have a religion anymore. You've destroyed their religion. And it's, and it's that simple. Our religion does not rely upon anything in this world existing. You could lose everything and still go to heaven. Aren't you glad for that? Say amen. Our religion and our salvation depends on nothing. On this world, it all depends on heaven. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. We thank you, Lord, for it. And Lord, I pray to your God that you would just give us wisdom and light uh, as we approach what, what can be a very hard to understand subject. Help me, dear God, to teach it as plainly and simple as you laid it out to me. Let it be for our learning. Let it be for a blessing, Father. And give us good teachings and help us to understand good doctrine, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen.